Welcome to the Mets pod. On today's show, we get into the Mets early rotation injuries. Is it time for David Peterson to take on a much bigger role? Meanwhile, Brett Beatty stays hot. Will he make the opening day roster? Joe and I take a look at Beatty's numbers throughout the spring. We also touch on Ronnie Mauricio's loud, loud spring training, the World Baseball Classic, and of course, your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets pod. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mets Pod. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co hosts, Joe DeMeo. And Joe, we have a lot to get through. Spring training rolls on. The World Baseball Classic is officially underway. And it would not be this time of year if the Mets didn't have some injury, maybe minor, major at the rotation. We have the same discussion every single year. When they have seven to eight starters, everybody goes, how are you going to make this work? And Joe's famous line is, these things tend to figure themselves out. So I think we start right there before we get into the much, much more positive. Look at Jose Quintana, right? A guy that has been really reliable lately. A guy that was signed as a back-end rotation um, starter for the Mets this offseason on a pretty low annual deal of only two years as well. And now he's going to miss some time. How much time that is, we don't have a definite answer because these rib stress fractures can vary. But the more important point here, Joe, is that it kind of amplifies the potential role of a Tyler McGill, David Peterson for sure, who had a minor foot injury throughout the spring, but it feels like the Mets got the best case news there. So here we are, the Mets rotation already needing needing some plugging of the holes. I mean, we'd say it all the time, right? You 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 set it up at the top that you can never have enough pitching and these things always work themselves out. We had segments for a couple of shows in the offseason about trading Carlos Carrasco because Many. now the Met that now the Mets had five starters and Peterson, who everyone's high on what he can do in 2023. Oh, he'd be in AAA. That doesn't seem fair. He should he should be in the rotation. So flip Carrasco, use Peterson, and lo and behold, it took less than a month of spring training for that rotation spot to open up for call it some period of time. Uh, like you said, it it does fluctuate on these stress fractures in the ribs. I mean, I, I think Chris Sale had one that kept him out like three or four months. So it really kind of depends. And David Peterson's ready for this. I mean, he's looked good this spring. Obviously, he had a fantastic year in 2022. So I don't think they're going to lose a ton by going from Quintana to Peterson uh, from a pure production standpoint. But it's just going to test that depth where we have talked about them being 9, 10 deep in the rotation. Now you just kind of like take one of those guys off temporarily. For sure. Quintana is an important part of this team, an important part of this rotation. And we expect him to have a big impact on the Mets. But when you look at injuries as they go, Fortunately, the Mets are built exactly for this type of injury. And if you want the glass half full of a guy like Peterson stepping in, and for those worried about Peterson's health as well, that, that's a foot bruise, which is the best possible case. You always worry about foot injuries with a, especially a bigger player, but that's a foot bruise. Sounds like he'll be fine. The upside, Joe, there's upside with David Peterson. David Peterson. I mean, this is somebody that the Mets took in the first round in 2017. He's someone that, seemed to get much more comfortable last year. We saw him work himself out of jams. We saw him be an effective starter when called upon. He had the 7-5 and five record. He pitched to a sub-4 ERA. The strikeouts over nine innings was significantly up, almost at a mark of, of 11, when two years before that it was at 7.2. So Peterson is finding ways to put away hitters with the swing and miss approach as well. So, listen, it's, it's not what you want, but you do have to be excited. And, I, and credit to him. He's a guy that kind of has a business-like attitude where if you're a former first-rounder, you've been effective in the most part when called upon. You look at it and go, what do I have to do to get in this rotation, even as a number five? And it feels like the Mets, whether it's him or McGill, would use a sixth man at times this year. That's just the nature of the schedule and the nature of the game, especially with Senga coming over and the schedule transition he will deal with. So for Peterson, a big opportunity falls right into his lap now. It's a massive opportunity for him to solidify himself into a spot in this rotation. Cause let's, I mean, even if you want to go on maybe a, like a longer time frame for a recovery, I don't want to speculate too much on when Quintana could be back. But I mean, if he's out until June or something like that, using that as a time frame, that gives 
two full months for David Peterson to establish himself as someone that should remain in the rotation when Quintana comes back. And at that point, if all things are going great, which I'm sure it won't be, someone else will get hurt, something else will occur. But then at that point, maybe you have a conversation of, you know, if everything's going well, who moves to the bullpen? Because if Peterson's pitching really well, I don't think you want to shuttle him back to AAA to to keep starting. Uh, does that push Carrasco into the bullpen or or maybe even Quintana? So, I mean, we're, we're getting a, uh, the horse ahead, uh, the cart ahead of the horse. The horse is always ahead you of get, the cart. You had so it. I, I, yeah, uh, we're getting the cart ahead of the horse here a little bit. But it's a great opportunity for Peterson, and he had many of them last year, and now he's going to kind of get that start from seemingly opening day unless the Mets get incredible news on Quintana. So let's briefly touch on Tyler McGill here, Joe, because – this is someone who was in the you know open season rotation last year. He started off with the big league club. We've seen flashes. Start opening day. Start opening day. People forget. It, yeah, it was out of nowhere, and and yeah. um, you know, big drip was fine with that. Really unfazed by it entirely. He started the Mets no hitter against the Phillies last year. I mean, McGill has had big time moments. With McGill, it feels like one staying healthy, of course, and two settling into an actual role it just feels like he's never fully comfortable with a bullpen bullpen transition we don't ultimately know what that would look like over a long period of time uh is he a guy that can eventually work deeper into games is he a guy that can stay healthy and i know this is this is a total projection question joe because it's it's early i mean we're sitting here in the beginning of march we we don't know what the rotation will ultimately look like but how do you envision the mets current plan and usage of mcgill as we near opening day I think McGill will start in AAA Syracuse and be the ace of the Syracuse staff. And he will be kind of the next guy up if something else happens. And we'll see how his arm holds up because that's another thing with McGill. Over the last couple of years, he's had these nagging injuries, bicep tendonitis, shoulder tendonitis. So nothing like he's not getting Tommy John and you know he's not blowing out ligaments in his arm. But you wonder if long-term he is going to be able to last as a starter and this is that's i think his opportunity this year like he'll he'll i'm sure pitch in the big leagues uh the mets are going to use eight nine ten hopefully not many more but in that range of starters this year so mcgill will get starts for the mets in 2023 but i think a, a good objective for him would be to get through 2023 healthy pitch a full season as a starter and then i think that establishes him as a starting pitcher going forward because if more nagging stuff happens then, you know, at in the Mets pod next offseason, when we're talking about the 2024 season, we're going to be talking about Tyler McGill needs to make a shift to a bullpen role in order to have a long term future here. And you have to look at these things like right now, as it stands, this rotation could go into an offseason where Max Scherzer opted out. Carlos Carrasco is a free agent. I mean, there's good. This is a big shot for these guys where they are trying to position themselves to not only be effective for this team this year in swing roles, but can they work their way into being number three or number four starters long-term? That's what they were drafted to be. McGill's definitely been, um, you know, a big surprise. Let's call it that considering where he was drafted, but Peterson was taken in the first round and you could speak to this better than me, Joe, but I think when you're drafted in the first round and his projection was, Hey, can you be a middle of the rotation starter and work your way to that? So, we will be tracking this situation week by week because it's definitely a big one, but we need to get into the fun. I, I can't take the the doomsday scenarios anymore. Brett Beatty, I, what can you say at this point, right, with Brett Beatty? And this is, this is what we were hoping for, Joe. We were hoping for the young guys to potentially force the hand of the New York Mets, not be given anything. And we know Buck Walter is not giving anyone anything. If anything, I feel like you have to overperform for Buck and Epler to come together and, and put a young guy in this spot on a team that has championship aspirations. Brett Beatty, and, and I'm stealing info from your tweet from, yes, from literally less than 24 hours ago, Joe, at PSL The Flushing. You said it's going to be really, he's making it tough on the Mets to send him back to the minors. He's up to 474 on the spring and should only receive more opportunities with Escobar going to the World Baseball Classic. Beatty looks like a pro hitter. He hits to all fields. He's got pop. The defense is fascinating because I think it's lacking consistency, but there's also flashes of stardom plays. There's big-time highlight reel plays. Joe, if he keeps this up or even just 
stays somewhat consistent. How is this guy not on the team on opening day? I wrote an article that came out on Monday that you could check out on SNY.TV. I wrote a little over 1,100 words on the state of the Mets farm system. And funny enough, I kind of forgot to put Alex Ramirez in there. And because I was so focused on who could emerge that I just kind of left another top 100 prospect out of the discussion. But uh, I had a little blurb about Beatty, Alvarez, Vientos, Mauricio, the guys that are kind of closer to the big leagues. And the question is, what does Brett Bay need to do to be deemed major league ready? I mean, when you think about the defense, that's what everyone's talking about is can Brett Beatty play third base? And like you like you said, Connor, there, there's flashes uh, in in Monday's game he or Tuesday's game. He uh, made that Nolan Arenado looking play. Yeah, going Machado, into foul Arenado, yeah. yeah, all those guys like he is capable. And one thing that I want to say, too, is everyone talks about. Well, keep the veteran Escobar. You know, he's he's a fine third baseman and you know, Beatty will develop. Escobar is not a particularly good third baseman. He was uh, negative 11 defensive runs saved in 2022. He was negative six outs above average. He's not a particularly good defensive third baseman. Is Beatty much worse than that? And if he is, the question then becomes, when will he not be? Is yeah. is going to AAA for a month magically going to turn around his defensive development? Is it three months? Because at some point, the bat is going to force their hand. I mean, you can't have a guy just saying, we need to get him a little better at third, but he's hitting 365 in Syracuse. Like, he's going to have to make his way up. And if third base is that much of a concern, put him in. I want to see reps in the outfield. Like, I think it's... I think he's going to make it very difficult on the Mets to not have him on the roster. And like I mentioned in that tweet, Escobar is with Team Venezuela in the WBC. So Beatty's going to get plenty of opportunity to show off his defensive prowess and obviously continue to hit like he does. And I'm looking at him as why shouldn't he be on the opening day roster? I mean, honestly, it's you're at the point where that's the question, right? Like, give me the why not. Don't give yeah. me the, you know, it's more of a matter of, because the bat, the bat is good to go. I don't care what anyone says. And I'm not overreacting to spring. I'm looking at it from his approach, his ability. He's not pigeonholed as a one-dimensional kind of hitter. Of course, what's around him. I, I like Escobar more than most Mets fans, to be honest with you, I feel like. But I also like Escobar a lot more as this utility, DH, clubhouse, has some pop on the bench. We know Buck plays all the guys. He's going to play. I am thinking of this uh, as can Brett Beatty within this three-year window, two-year window, be one of the best young hitters in baseball? Can and I really, I mean, there, this guy's a top thirty prospect, Joe. Like this isn't like oh, it's a nice story or where did he come from? We've been waiting on first-round pick Brett Beatty since his name was called on draft night. He's been one of the best hitters in the organization. He's filled out he's a massive dude i mean it's it the work ethic is obviously there this is going to be fascinating for the mets it really really is because you always they are a team right now that's win now and a lot of win now teams across sports defer to veterans that's what they do because they see a floor with veterans and that they don't see with players that are not established players that haven't had much major league experience if Betty just keeps hitting like this you got to find out. And if it doesn't work out for a month, who cares, right? Like who you have, it's the longest season in professional sports in terms of the amount of games you can deal with a month of not getting anything out of third base. We've seen Escobar do that for four months last year and they still gave, kept it going with him. So I, it's just going to be a funny story to me. And I, once again, to take something from you, I don't want to put, uh, you know, the cart before the horse here. But if the Mets not getting the chance to sign Manny Machado and the Correa deal falling through ends up being a blessing because Brett Beatty takes over within the next year and turns into one of the NL's best young hitters, it's going to be an awesome story to watch. Sports just work like that, right? They do, like, yes. It, it just feels like uh, that's probably what's going to happen. And you look at Atlanta, you're talking about contenders uh, shading towards veterans. They brought Michael Harris up from double A. 
They brought Vaughn Grissom up from double A and those guys performed out the gate. So at some point, even if you're a contender, you have to give an opportunity to someone that earned it. And, you know, maybe Brett B hasn't quite earned it in their eyes, but the question that I want to ask, and I, I guess I'm going to give myself a homework assignment to actually ask people in the Mets about this. Like, how long does he need? Like, that's what I want to know from a defensive standpoint. Because I don't think there's anyone saying the bat isn't major league ready. Doesn't mean he's going to take over the league as a rookie, but he should hit at the big league level with at, at least as much consistency that Escobar kind of lacked last year, right? Yep. Escobar was not particularly good offensively for most of the year, and he was not good defensively pretty much at all. So I want to know how much time he has left on that development train defensively, and if there is a true benefit to him getting that last bit of development in AAA, or can he learn a bit on the job with a Francisco Lindor next to him? That's the big question. And, you know, time will tell. The good thing is there's a lot of spring left. There's a lot of time still to see what Beatty can do. But boy, has he come in motivated and all that work paying off and he's looked great. And it's it's the biggest storyline. And it kind of brings me to the, the next young storyline. And we can't forget this guy. And the reason we talk about Beatty in a different light is because he was he was called up last year. Like Beatty's close, dangerously close. Mauricio, on the other hand, there was no expectations this spring to make the team or anything even nearing that. The questions were, can you carry over your success from the fall league, which was phenomenal, continue to show off the pop as you fill out that frame, which he has, and just have a little bit better of an approach at the plate regarding balls and strikes and strikeout rate. And the deal is, Joe, I mean, I really want to frame it like this to you because you follow these guys literally week by week throughout their careers. Ha compared to your expectations for Mauricio coming into the spring, where is where is he at right now? And what have you seen that has put him above that bar? He's definitely exceeded my expectations. I have long been the low man on Ronnie Mauricio amongst the media. Um, I am a big approach guy. That's just something that I find to be a, the most translatable skill from the minor leagues to the major leagues. You'll see guys hit home runs in the minors, don't hit home runs in the majors. But if you can recognize breaking balls, if you can take balls and swing at strikes and work counts and put yourself in an advantageous position, that's something that does translate to the next level. And Mauricio just did not have much of that at all in double A. It was a little better in the winter league where he won MVP of the Dominican winter ball. Um, and so far in the early going in spring, you're seeing him be a little bit more selective. And that's all I'm looking for from him. I don't, Ryan Mauricio is not going to become Brandon Nimmo, where he's drawing walks and having a 400 on base. But there are plenty of players in baseball that hover in the 315, the 330 on base percentage that are still valuable players because of other skills they bring to the table. And Mauricio is going to bring power. We've seen it. 450 foot home run. Exit velocity is 105, 108, 110, hits the ball hard consistently. He's grown into his body and into that power. Now for him, he needs to go to AAA Syracuse. There should be no consideration at all for him cracking the Mets roster on opening day and probably, and maybe not even this season. Maybe the, you know, maybe it's a second half thing at best, but I'm looking at him go to AAA Syracuse, show that you're continuing to grow in your pitch selectivity. And that doesn't mean drawing walks. Like I said, that means finding balls to hit and being able to showcase that power and figure out where you're playing defensively because he's not a shortstop once he's in the major leagues with uh, Lindor, obviously, in tow with the Mets. He has the opportunity to maybe look at third base. That's something he had indicated he wanted to do. I would love to throw him in the outfield and see what that athleticism can do in left field. I don't know if the Mets are interested, willing, but that's one thing I would like to see. And yeah, from there, you just see how he develops and then come trade deadline time, depending on what's available. If Mauricio performs so well and maybe it's he's not an outfielder, he's going to be an infielder, maybe that heightens the possibility of him being traded at the deadline. So we all know how prospects work. There's two ways they can provide value to an organization. One coming up themselves and doing it for you, or two, 
getting you a piece in trade from another organization. So we'll see where Mauricio's at, but I really like the growth that he's had over call the last four months. You have to. You have, he's really reestablished himself as a player that matters so much to this organization when it felt like it's been interesting roller coasters to watch, right? Alvarez and Beatty have kind of just been a consistent line upward. Vientos, a little bit more wavier. And then for two years, the power department put him on the map and he just didn't really get to do much last year with the Mets. And then Mauricio has just been this squiggly line because there's times where the guy can't make contact and there's guys where times where the guy hits the ball literally 500 feet and you're like, what? And, and that's baseball, right? Some guys are just, they're like that. They could be, you know, lightning in a bottle. They can be, uh, they don't put bat to ball, but when they do, it goes a long way. You just want to see that improve a little bit with more with Mauricio. And listen, the Mets have seen players like this. They watched Javi Baez for the latter half of a season before. And when everything's clicking with Baez, the ball goes out of the yard over and over again. When things are not clicking, he can't get on base. So Mauricio finding the sweet spot of just improving those little things will go a long way. And it'll be, I, I keep saying, it'll be really exciting to track his progress in the minor leagues this year. So all these spring training games are going on, but we actually have the stakes a little higher now. The World Baseball Classic has officially begun this week. Joe, I know you'll be watching. You are a baseball junkie. There's no doubt about that. Uh, are you, is there anything you watch for this? Is it, you like to see some young players get opportunities on this stage because they might be playing for a roster that has opportunity for them. Do you like the star power of it? Uh, do you have a favorite for the entire thing? I, I know somebody that put a wager on, on the DR. I won't say who they are, but I mean, that's a pretty good powerhouse team and the odds were, were favorable at the time. What are you looking at in this event? I got to say the Dominican Republic put out a lineup here for Wednesday. Robinson Cano is batting fifth. For the <laughs> that's Dominican a legacy Republic. thing. That's yeah, that's a but, legacy uh, thing. He's not even remotely close to a top yeah. player on that roster. Yeah. But for me, I thought it was the young players and the people that are coming. Like I look at the Japanese team as a team that I'm really interested in because they frequently do really well in the world baseball classic. They gel together well as a team. Whereas like the USA is probably going to do really good just because they have so much talent, but it kind of feels like you're just taking a bunch of stars and putting them together and trying to make a team out of it. Uh, but Japan always seems to gel as a unit and they have a couple guys that are, I don't know, two to four years away from probably coming to America. But pitcher Roki Sasaki is probably the top prospect, I guess you'd say, in the World Baseball Classic. He's 21 years old, uh, up to 103 miles an hour with slider, like big power stuff. Like he looks like a future big league ace in the light of like a U Darvish and someone like that. They have Munitaka Mirakami. I may be pronouncing that first name wrong, but uh, he's a 21-year-old third baseman that hit 56 home runs this past year. Uh, over in the NPB. So I really like Team Japan. And that's what I thought I was into until I turned on the game on Tuesday night at 11, right? Right. I was getting ready for bed. I fell asleep with Cuba versus the Netherlands on my TV. Yeah, late and night. Seeing Joannis Cespedes come up with the yellow sleeve and everything for Cuba and, sw and swing through a hanging curveball as I'm falling asleep. Uh, I was just like, man, Cespedes, this is great. And then Wednesday morning, I turn on for Panama versus Chinese Taipei, I believe. And um, Ruben Tejada is the starting shortstop for Panama. Like for me, I think I'm almost getting more into the random names that are like blasts from the past that are still hanging around in the WBC. Don't forget Matt Harvey's on Italy, Joe. Oh, electric. The World Baseball Classic yeah. is literally the glory of the 2015 New York Mets. <laughs> it's got it's got it all. It's got it all. But yeah. no, I'm I love this event. I love international sporting events, obviously, whether it's Olympics, World Cup. I think the World Baseball Classic has a really great energy to it. And maybe it's just me. It feels like this year more guys are more than ever are eager to play in it. There's a it's being taken seriously. It's being taken in a different manner. Um, and like you said, the randomness of it is very funny. I had to look up. So Cano did bat fifth in an exhibition game or is batting fifth in an exhibition game. I think it'll be happening. Why, you know, at, as we record. And so there's a couple things to this. Apparently he's the captain of that team. Apparently also, well, not apparently it's obvious. Vlad juniors out. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Candelario will be arriving to replace him, but this team, Julio Rodriguez, Rafael Devers, Manny Machado, Eloy Jimenez, Willie Adamas, like this team, Juan Soto. 
this team is just stupid good. Stupid good. And that's what you got the powerhouse teams. The DR is one. Of course, Puerto Rico is loaded. Team USA has obviously Alonzo and McNeil, but they got Trey Turner, Mookie Betts, Mike Trout, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado. Like, I don't. Their if pitching a, is a problem, though. USA pitching the, is a yeah. It's a problem with a lot of the good teams. I think the DR yeah. is a little top heavy as well. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure that pretty sure the ace of USA is Wainwright, who's fine, but <laughs> the but like I don't know who the number two is, and uh, they have a couple used good bullpen arms, including a couple from the Mets with Adovino and Brooks Raley, both on Team USA. But if Team USA is going to win it all, it's going to be on the backs of all those offensive players that you mentioned, and not the pitching. Yeah, same with the DR team. And those are the two favorites in the entire tournament. And I think that's great for the tournament because you want to see offense in this thing. You mm -hmm. you don't want to see games that are two to one. Um, it'll get people more invested in the event. So if you're a baseball junkie I don't, or even just a casual fan, I don't know how you can't absolutely adore what the World Baseball Classic is, is putting out there. And uh, Joe and I joke, but it's also like half joking. You want the teams that have Mets on them to get eliminated because I am going to be, while enjoying this event, walking on eggshells every time a Met is playing and praying that nobody gets hurt. They already lost a guy that was supposed to play in the event in Quintana. He had to drop out. No more injuries. Yeah, no more injuries. And they have, like we said, plenty of players. They have pitchers there. They have hitters. We don't need any hit by pitches, which seems to happen to the Mets here in the major league season. So let's avoid all of that. And unfortunately, USA being one of the favorites, I, I would agree that they're one of the best teams and will probably last, which means Alonzo and McNeil will be gone for a little bit. So uh, I'm, I am really excited to watch it. I won't say that I'll catch every game, but the games well, that are on sleep. late. Yeah, I go to sleep like a normal person, but or earlier than a normal person. Yeah, maybe even. yeah, you're kind of yeah. towing the line, by the way. <laughs> I'm towing the line. I'm towing the line a little bit. But when you think about it, uh, yeah, it's just going to be cool to see all these countries compete. And kind of to, you know, really quickly to close out this discussion, I like like the players that you don't even know where they're from. Like if I had no idea that Xander Bogarts was Netherlands, like that's what team that Xander Bogarts is on. Kira I, Curacao yeah, yeah. has a lot of stars from baseball. I think Ozzy Albies is from there. I want yeah. to say so. Yeah, yes. no, you're right. It's one of those things that's kind of slept on. Um, yeah. Albies is from there. That's a, those are Dutch territory. So people are like, what, what are they? It's like, yeah, Kearsau produces incredible baseball talent. You're right. It opens the door to not realizing the different backgrounds. Freddie Freeman's on team Canada. Like there yeah. it's like we said, Matt Harvey on Italy. I, I'm with you. Um, it's just, it's a really well done event it seems to be getting better all right we have a hefty mailbag so before we get into that a reminder you're listening to the Mets pod subscribe to the Mets pod Apple podcast Spotify you will never miss a show if you do so SMY's YouTube if you want to watch us or wherever you get your podcast like I said as promised Joe hefty mailbag some things we didn't include at the top because it's just easier to angle in with your questions this one from Thomas Hahn who asked does Tim LaCastro have a chance of making the opening day roster. Joe, I think LaCastro has some of the best sprint speed in all of baseball in recent years. Do you think he has a shot to be that kind of runner, defensive replacement guy for this team? Over like the last four years, LaCastro has been between the 98th and 100th percentile in sprint speed. So he's genuinely one of the fastest players in baseball. Historically, he simply has not hit enough to stick How many times did we see this story? Yeah, but this spring... He's hitting the heck out of the ball. Yeah. Extra base hits, barreling it up consistently. With that said, I find it hard to believe they're going to be able to find a spot for him on the opening day roster. I think he will end up in AAA Syracuse to start off. I think, you know, he, he's been off to a rough start in spring, but they have six million reasons why Tommy Pham should be at yeah. least given an opportunity to be the fourth outfielder. And if he performs like he has in the early going in spring, He's not going to last the whole season on the roster. And if LaCastro Le performs in AAA, he can make his way up. I'm sure we'll see him at some point. But I would put his odds of being on the major league roster without further injury at pretty low. So LaCastro in his career is 33 for 39 in stolen base attempts, um, which is just, I want to make sure I had that right. Or no, he is 39 for 44, I believe. So... I mean, remarkable base stealer, incredible sprint speed. 
he's gotten some opera. His biggest opportunity was with Arizona in 2019. He played in 91 games. He actually had a 357 on base percentage, which is really good for him. That was his career high in steals. He stole 17 bases, never got caught stealing that year. Was on the Yankees last year. Only played 38 games. Uh, went eight for 10 in steals. But like you said, Joe, just wasn't able to hit. That's the issue. He's a New York guy. So, you know, easy to root for. He's, he's from upstate New York. He played for Ithaca. Is you know, it's it's it feels like a player that you keep in the system and you love to have him in the extra inning situation, but it's probably a postseason roster candidate, maybe as we've it, seen teams. It's, it's Terrence Gore. It's Terrence really Gore. Terrence Gore Terrence, all Terrence. over again. And, and what's interesting too, despite that sprint speed, he's not much of a center fielder. He's more of a left fielder, actually, yeah. defensively, despite that. And uh, to his credit with those sprint with the sprint speed, one other uh, little fact about him. Torres ACL just a couple of years ago and still came back and maintained that top of sports sprint speed. So you'll see Tim LaCastro at some point this year. I don't know if it'll be later on in the year or as an injury replacement in, you know, the spring or early summer. Uh, I just, I don't see the spot on opening day. All right. This one is from Steve Cohen fan. He said, what changes would you and Connor like to see to the new rules? What positive or negative consequences have you noticed with the new rules one I've realized is shorter games means less time for broadcasters to tell their stories and give analysis. It's kind of, it's an interesting take about the the pacing. And that's definitely, you know, the diehard baseball fan will miss those things. I, I'm in that category. I know it's not for everybody, but I, I like when the game the booth gets time to breathe. And maybe we're spoiled because we watch the best booth in baseball. It's I mean, under like consensus best booth in baseball. But I think for me, Joe. And this is nitpicking. I've actually really enjoyed the new rules, to be honest with you. I, without this question, I wouldn't even really raise this complaint. I feel like the pitch clock needs about three more seconds. Is that insane? I feel like it's just a hair quick. And I'm this isn't a I don't have a problem with this, but I'm fascinated to watch it. Did you see a team move their left fielder to double up in right field against Joey Gallo? They played with yep. no left fielder, and yep. it's rule compliant. Because the infielders cannot be on the grass. There is no rule about shifting around your outfielders. What did you think of that scenario? I'm surprised Buck didn't do that first to somebody. Like, I, I assumed that That's would be like a, a Buck yeah, Show. Right. I figured that would be a Buck Showalter thing. But look, anytime there's a rule, you're going to work your way around it. And uh, as far as the pace of game and broadcast booth, I think we're looking from a different perspective. I bet if you ask a bunch of fans of other teams in the sport, they probably want less of their broadcast booth than 100%. they. 100%. So I think that's a factor. For me, the one thing that it's not even a complaint, I think it's more clarity. It feels inconsistent with the uh, on the pitch clock side of things, not for the pitcher, but for the hitter. Like they have to be By far. looking before eight seconds and. Sometimes it, it's been called. It looks like they were set and looking, but still got called. So I think there needs to be a little more clarity on that portion of the rule. But I think that's that's all stuff that's going to hammer itself out over time. And we're going to we're going to adjust to it. I don't think there's a significant problem with any of the rules. I like the shift. Um, Love the, the shift. two pick. Yeah, the two pickoffs. I think I probably could have done without that rule in general. But because I think but they're adding stolen bases back to the game. and. And things like that so it'll it'll add some excitement there's some take and give there uh just from my perspective it's just the hitters and the pitch clock can be a little confusing it is i think my three seconds was kind of just to get let everybody have a little more breathing time because it, the batters are doing worse with it than the pitchers the pitchers um it's a big adjustment and it, but i i love all the new rules as a whole and i'm with you my goal or my hope is that there are more runners on base in baseball and there is more athleticism, base running going on. And I think that makes the sport better. I really, really do. And it's become a lost art of the game and they're trying to find a way to tailor it back to that. This one from the Datalorian said, should the Mets have a captain this year? And if so, who is your pick? Before you go, Joe, I think we're not there yet. I think there's not... Maybe next year, but I think right now, also, I think it's pretty tricky. I, I'm not, do you go to Pete? Do you go to Lindor? Do you go to Nimmo? Do you just avoid naming a captain because you have a leadership group at the top? 
that you don't need somebody that just wears it and then when it is deferred on all the time. So I guess if I had to pick, and once again, I would prefer really, I don't think they need one right now. I would go with Lindor. He's going to be here a while. He's respected by everybody. He performed last year. He's an emotional leader. He's a smart guy. He says all the right things. Um, but th- back to it, I-, I don't think this is a layup decision. In my opinion, baseball shouldn't have captains. There should be no captains in baseball for any team ever. I don't think the Mets need a captain ever. And like, I think they agree. I yeah. think they agree with you. And people don't wear the C's anymore either, which is like a football thing. Well, and a judge hockey not. Thing. No, Judge won't be wearing the C. I mean, David yeah. Wright was the captain of Mets. He didn't wear a C. Keith That's Hernandez true. did back in the day. So I don't know. Like, it, it doesn't really do anything for me. Like, I don't think there is a captain in baseball. I think, you know, you have your locker room leaders. And if you want to, I guess, just say, hey, Pete is the biggest influence in the locker room or Lindor is the biggest and you want to call him the captain, I guess go for it. But for me, I don't think captains is a baseball thing. I wouldn't have one ever. I would just let them keep going. And whoever is the leader of the locker room is the leader of the locker room. And I think that's recognized without a patch on the jersey saying like (laughs) Alonzo does have to show up. And if some young player is talking back or something, he points to the C on his jersey and goes, you will listen to me because I'm the captain. Like, no, that's that's not for me. So I don't think they need a captain now or ever. I don't think that's a crazy take. I don't really see the value in it. Um, the Mets don't lack leadership, okay? Right. They don't lack leadership, so they don't need to manufacture leadership. That's a good thing. Last question of the day, Joe, comes from me. The Mets released their promos, and let me be honest, it's incredible. I don't remember a year like this where the Mets have – this kind of promo list, you could find it on MLB.com slash, you know, the Mets Twitter released it, but it's Mets tickets, promotion schedule. There's all kinds of bobbleheads. We have a Lindor grass growing bobblehead. We have a Howie Rose one, uh, which looks like a stack of books next to him. Pete Alonzo sunglasses night. They do all the jerseys, a basketball jersey, a soccer jersey, a football jersey, a hockey jersey. Joe, I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to tell you right away. You cannot pick Edwin Diaz trumpet bobblehead night as your favorite because, yes, that should be everyone's favorite, especially yours. What is your favorite promo giveaway on the schedule? Because it's it's loaded. Loaded this They game. loaded it up. A lot of unique stuff. It's not just like different style T-shirts or something. Like It's a bunch of different unique stuff. So I'm actually really into the schedule. And by the way, my only complaint, a lot of the bobbleheads are on weekday games. and That's the point, Joe. They need no people to go. I, I well, I get it, but it's not convenient for me. So I'm being selfish here. So like I'm I'm gonna have to find a way to get out of work early so I can head down to get the Edwin Diaz one. But I'll tell you, the one that kind of stuck out to me, I want to. I, I assume it's just like a cool glow in the dark baseball. But thinking of a Kodai Senga ghost glow in the dark ball, like I mean, props to the marketing department or whoever is thinking Crush these it. things. Because I think this year's promo schedule is probably the best I've ever seen. And uh, my mom will love the bucket hat day, so I'll take her to that. She'll she'll be all about the bucket hat. Uh, so they, I think they have a little something for everybody. And I'm a bobblehead guy. So, hey, if I, if I can't make it to the Edwin Diaz bobblehead game for a reason or another, I'm going to need some listener here of the Mets pod uh, to hook me up with, with that there bobblehead. So for me, they haven't released a picture of it yet, but I'm hoping the hockey jersey is a hit. That would be number one for me if they do it right. We haven't seen the picture yet. Number two, I, I'm torn. The bobbleheads are all great, like unbelievable. They did a Starling Marte Black Panther inspired one. It's awesome. They made Mr. Met Indiana Jones. I have no idea why, but I like how off the rails that is. It's just, I mean, the Diaz trumpet one, everybody is going to want that one. Um, the Mets killed it with this and they have such a talented team. You know, there should be no motivate extra motivation for people to need to go to the stadium, but this will do the trick. If you're going to go in on something like this, go all in. And with that, it concludes another episode of the Mets pod. So Joe, we're getting closer. We got baseball to watch. I think you and I are tinkering or getting close to the point of spring training is old. Okay. I want real baseball. Now we get excited and then we're like, all right, enough. World Baseball Classic will give us a little bit of an appetizer. Closing thoughts for today's show. 
I'm at the point where I'm just looking to see the young guys play. Like I tune in to see Beatty at bats and Vientos at bats and Mauricio and even when Kevin Parada and Alex Ramirez get in the game, I want to see that. And I'm tracking the bottom of the bullpen. That's really what it comes down to. And I, th I think John Curtis is making quite he a looks, case he looks for great. himself. He he looks pre Tommy John form. So I think he's trending in the right direction. Uh, yeah, I think I'm ready for baseball to get started and I'll be tuned into the World Baseball Classic. I want to see all these teams. I want to see more random 2015 Mets that are probably littered around the world that I don't even know are on a WBC team. And I'll just turn on Fox Sports 1 or whatever channel it's on and boom, there's some random 2015 Met in my face. Yeah, where is Juan Uribe? Somebody find me Juan his son, Uribe. His son got signed by the White Sox last year. So Juan Uribe go. Jr. is now um, a pro baseball player, which is just a sign of how old we're getting that all these players that it's not, you don't have to go back in time to remember watching Juan Uribe. That's just a few years ago. And his son is already a, a pro baseball player. I mean, Fernando Tatis played for the Mets not that long ago, and his yeah. son is one of the best young players in the game. And with that, yep. we remind you to subscribe to the Mets pod. You'll never miss a show. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMYs, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.